Yes, yes. Welcome back to In Context, putting the world's most pressing issues in context. I'm Richard Sudan, bringing you another fresh interview. Now, we have a very special guest with us here today. He goes by the name of Tariq Nasheed. Tariq is a filmmaker, activist, writer, museum founder, businessman, musician. He's here with us today for a special chat. Um, I've been a big uh, supporter of Tariq's work the last couple of years. He's been raising the profile of reparations, among other issues. Tariq, welcome to the show, man. Hey, good to see you again, my brother. Rich, pleasure to be here with you again. Great to have you. Great to have you. Now, I was, man, there's so much I want to talk to you about. And I was trying to think about what are the most pressing things to really get into. But you know what? It's February in the US. It's, yeah. it's Black History Month. So I want to wish you and all the Black American family across the pond, I want to wish you guys a happy Black History Month. Uh, we yeah. see you. We acknowledge you. We acknowledge your contributions to the world, the achievements, etc., an invaluable part of the diaspora. So. With that said, I'm thinking about some of the audience that might not be familiar with you unless they've been living on the moon. So, yeah. All right. So black people built America, you know, from from the ground up. And we're talking about whether it's foundational black Americans, the descendants of of slaves in America, whatever you want to call it. We're talking about the same thing. So let's break down. Um, Let's start from the ground up. How did black people build America? Well, we have to understand when we use the term foundational black American, we mean just that. There was no wealth in this part of the Western Hemisphere before foundational black Americans labor generated the wealth and our ingenuity and our genius, even through oppression, built this nation. And I'll go even deeper than that. Not only did foundation of black Americans build the United States and the wealth of the United States, the Black people who were in the Americas, including the Caribbean, we built the wealth of the entire Western society because Europe wasn't popping like that before the transatlantic slave trade and the slave trade in the Americas, Um, the people over here generating the wealth for the European um, colonies and infrastructure. They didn't have anything popping before Um, Black people did all the labor and the agrarian work and the engineering work over here to help build up European society. So we are instrumental in building up the wealth and the prosperity of the world to a certain degree, but 100% definitely the United States. Without the uh, foundational Black American input in that, there would be no United States. The white supremacists tried to build something over here. They tried to get colonies on their own, and they famously failed multiple times. When the Spanish came um, around the early 1500s and tried to set up a colony in the North Carolina, South, well, the South Carolina, Georgia area, they failed there. When they tried to set up a colony in St. Augustine, they repeatedly failed there. They failed in um, Roanoke, um, they just repeatedly failed over and over again, doing it on their own. So the only time they had any level of success, when the success started rolling in, is when Black people were entered into the picture as a mainstay. So we have to acknowledge that, and that's a big movement over here now, because we've allowed people to make it seem like we are guests in a nation that we built. They make it seem like we don't have a place here where the people who are foundational black Americans are a combination of our African brothers and sisters who were brought over um, on the ships and the black Aboriginal people who were already here. That's a major component that's never talked about. There were a lot of black people already on this land, which is very well documented. So we all became amalgamated together to become what are now known as the foundation of black Americans. 100%, 100%. And something I wanted to get to touch on, actually, because I I get tired of hearing the kind of pushback when it comes to the facts, is people suggest there was a kind of level playing field in America from the get-go. Not only did Black people build America, but I would argue that the uh, European immigrants that came to America, they got certain privileges, certain leg-ups, certain advantages, um, um, you know, to to kind of uh, really build the, the system of inequality. So, yeah, if you could touch on that, maybe. 
Yes, indeed. Well, yeah, some of the immigrants that came over, they really didn't have too much input in the building of the United States, because um, why would you pay somebody to do something where you own a person and they're doing the work for you? And the fact that they owned us and didn't have to pay us, that was the thing that generated the wealth. That's why this country got so wealthy so fast. You had people doing all of this stuff for absolutely free, and the money is being compounded over and over again and locked into white society. So yeah, it becomes the powerful, the most mighty nation on the, the planet because you're not paying the people who's doing the actual work and they're still trying not to pay us. This is what the reparations movement is about. It's time to get that check. It's time to get the money because we're owed that. 100%. I'm gonna, uh, we're going to dig into that in a bit. Um, I wanted to also um, familiarize our audience really with the presence of black people prior uh, to the slave trade. Because I think there's a bit of a misconception there. So I wanted to really talk about, if you could, the kind of relationship between uh, the Native Americans, because a lot of people really seem to pretend the Native Americans were kind of one monolith and looked a particular way. But the evidence really leads us to understand that black people were part of the kind of Native Americans too. And then maybe you could talk a little bit about the Seminoles and groups like this that have really been there from, from the outset. I want people to understand when um, black people left Africa, they went all over the planet. You go to the Andaman Islands as black people. You go to parts of Asia that are isolated and unmixed. There are black people. I'm talking about black skin, wide noses, big lips, and afros, and I've seen them. I've been in their, their huts and their villages before. You go over to China, you see this. You go to the Philippines, you see this. I was just in Fiji. Fiji has a bunch of black people with big afros, um, beautifully melanated skin, who acknowledge their distant ancestral lineage going to Africa. Um, you go to the Samoan Islands, big afros, big noses, black skin people. Um, even Hawaii, some of the OG Hawaiians in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, black skinned people, Afros, big noses. Um, people understand that those folks traveled all over the world and you had these people with the black phenotypes all over the planet. And then they want to act dumb believing that those same people couldn't reach this large landmass. There were absolutely black people here in the Americas. Down in Brazil, they did some DNA testing and found some skeletal remains of the oldest inhabitant of the Americas. It was a black woman who they call Luzia. So our presence here in the Americas is solidified. We have the Olmec statues down there in South America. You have some of the um, black Aboriginal tribes that's still around in certain pockets of the Americas. You have the Amariski people that's down there in the Nicaragua area. So uh, that's, that's still there. They're still there. Um, we have black groups who are like the Yamasi. You have the Seminoles, which this, the, the military arm of the Seminoles, they were black. And the word Seminole means run away. Um, you had the red natives who were often co-opted by the white supremacists when they came over to kind of turn against the black Aboriginal people, which is a tactic that the white supremacists have always used. They use that in Africa. They would use certain tribes, bring them in to turn in the other tribes. That's how they got us caught up. They, they're not a strong people. They just know how to use deception in a way that we've never really imagined. All right, so let's... Uh... I hope you lot are listening, by the way. Pay attention to what you're hearing, because this is stuff you're not really going to hear in the mainstream. Now, one thing I really wanted to chat to you about, Tariq, was resistance movements um, oh, yeah. in the United States, how important they were for black liberation, but also how some of those movements have really gone on, if we're being honest, to inform and inspire other resistance movements around the world. For example, Ho Chi Minh, Vietnamese resistance, used to sit in on the meetings of Marcus Garvey. Now... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I just mentioned it a second ago, but um, if you could please break down, yeah, a bit more about the Seminoles and maybe some of the other groups. I know you've um, delved into that in your films and just yeah. how rebellious they were, just how much of a pain in the ass they were to the white supremacists. You know, we hear about the Nanny of the Maroons and all the, all the fantastic resistance movements in the Caribbean, but what are some of the things you've learned on your sort of travels um, about the black American resistance movements lesser known about? Yes, indeed. Um, there's always been a black resistance movement here in the beginning of the Americas. The very first group of people who were documented foreigners to settle here were black people who were 
uh, brought over by the Spanish, enslaved, and then they fought their way out of slavery and got their freedom and then blended in with the Native American tribes here. That was 1526. That was in San Miguel del Guadalupe over in um, the South Carolina area. We've always had these resistance movements. We've always fought against the white supremacists and oppression because um, when they captured some of the black people in Africa and they captured the black aboriginals here, we have to understand this was the warrior class that they were capturing. They captured the warrior class in Africa. These were people who were deceived by some of the um, collaborating tribes with the white supremacists. And we didn't understand the level of treachery where people would turn other folks in to this new entity that was an evil force that we weren't really used to. Um, that resistance mindset, that warrior mindset came to the Western Hemisphere. When you look at the Haitian Revolution, a lot of the people in the Haitian Revolution down in Haiti, these were people from Angola, people from Central Africa who were warriors. That's why they turned up so hard and, and got their freedom in Haiti. We've always had that warrior spirit here. Um, during the Civil War, the United States government, they admitted they, they would not have won the Civil War if it weren't for the black freedmen. And many of these freedmen were black maroons who came out of the swamp, the Great Dismal Swamp in particular, and they had a resistance movement that was never infiltrated in the Great Dismal Swamp. Um, that was one of the few places where black people didn't take an L in the last 300 years. There's only two places where black people never took an L. That's the Great Dismal Swamp of North Carolina and Virginia, it was a sanctuary for the Underground Railroad that they maintained for centuries that was never penetrated by the white supremacists. And they study that place to this day. In fact, the um, a private military company, Blackwater, set up shop over there in the Great Dismal Swamp so they can study the tactics of the Black Maroons. And the second place that never took an L with Black people was North Sentinel Island over there in the Indian Ocean. And that place, the white supremacists, they've never infiltrated those brothers and sisters because they kill everybody on sight. So there's been resistance movements here, um, different parts of the world, but our resistance movement, because it's been so consistent, it has galvanized other movements around the world. Most certainly. So this is, I promise you, this is going to be new information to a lot of people. So I want you guys to go and check out what Tariq's talking about, particularly the resistance movements in the swamps. There were uh, black people born, lived, spent their whole lives in those swamps, and they were an integral part of resistance against the white supremacists, but also other Native American tribes, if we're being real, uh, some of whom uh, caught runaway slaves and tried to put them back into slavery. Now, um, so we touched on that. Now, a lot of people also won't have heard of the centers, the cities, the hubs of black excellence in America, which even in spite of white supremacy over hundreds of years, you had thriving centers of life, business, culture, ingenuity, and the white supremacists and the structures have done everything they can to really raise these places to the ground. Um, so maybe you could uh, maybe you could start with Oscarville, Tariq, and talk about what Oscarville was, the significance of it, and maybe what happened, which was, I think, about 100 years ago. Um, Oscarville was basically burnt to the ground and, and hundreds of black people were murdered. Right, Oscarville, that was one of the many um, Black-owned towns, the Black-run towns that was in the Americas that was self-sufficient. You had Black people who were thriving there. And all over the country, you had Black people who were thriving in certain pockets of America. And Oscarville in particular, which is indicative of a lot of places, they um, took the Black people and, and ran them out, killed many of the Black people in Oscarville, Georgia. And then they flooded the place. They created something called Lake Lanier, and to this very day, people say that Lake Lanier is haunted. Thousands of deaths, if not hundreds of thousands of deaths, happen at Lake Lanier all the time. People say that there's like a some an energy pulling people into the water. But Oscarville, that was only one of the few places. They flooded black towns all over the United States. That was a dirty tactic of the white supremacists. They'll get a black town and um, destroy the businesses, run the people out or kill them and then make a lake over the town. Um, also, they would do things like bomb places like they did Tulsa, Oklahoma. They actually dropped a bomb, and that was the first time the United States government or any bomb was dropped on a city in the United States government, them dropping a bomb on black people. Um, another bomb was dropped in Philadelphia in the 1980s. There was a black organization called MOVE, and they had a black power movement going on, and 
there was a standoff with the police and the police just came in and dropped bombs and blew up a whole city block in the 1980s. So these people look at themselves as being at warfare and war with us because they understand what we are capable of. There's always been this need to subjugate foundational black Americans here on this land. Even J. Edgar Hoover in the Cointelpro papers that um, came out in the 1970s. The whole narrative with J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI is that we must prevent the rise of a black messiah, meaning we must prevent the rise of any black prominence of progress. It always has to be thwarted. So when people talk about pull yourselves up by your bootstraps, you've never had a COINTELPRO program um, deliberately designed against your progress. So that's what we're dealing with, and we're still fighting against that to this day. For sure. And um, I want to remind people, too, that there's a sanitized, whitewashed version of the great late Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, People cherry pick the quotes they like from him. But Mm -hmm. Dr. Martin Luther King was very clear, uh, Tariq, right, that he um, we're coming to Washington. We're coming to get our check. And I think he dealt with the whole bootstraps uh, nonsense, I believe, in that speech, if if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And later in Dr. King's life, Dr. King was was talking like Elijah Muhammad and certain people who were considered radical. He started talking about the need for reparations. He used his platform to kind of veer away from the, we all got to hold hands in Kumbaya. And he said, hey, you kind of owe us because of all of the stuff you've done to us. You've deprived us of, uh, us of resources. You've devastated our communities. You've given the tax dollars to all of these other groups and, and raised them up over us. So we're going to go back to Washington. But this time, we're going to be very clear with our mission. We're going to have to get a check for foundational Black Americans, because the first time they went to Washington, um, you had the Kennedys and all of these people who got with certain Black leaders and Black organizations and kind of chipped them off money to say, hey, don't let your, your, your content be a little radical. Don't get too crazy with the way you're talking out here. So a lot of the talk was very kumbaya and and sanitized at the first march on Washington. Dr. King understood this time he has to go in hard body. And remember, when Dr. King was assassinated, his popularity was in the tank. They were writing op-ed pieces about our brother, demonizing him, marginalizing him in the media, putting a target on his back. So I think he knew that some was going to go down. But the, the great thing is when um, when, our doc, when our good brother did pass away, the Foundation of Black Americans here turned all the way up in the United States. It was something called Hell Week. There were riots and turnups all over the country, which forced the United States government to put in the Civil Rights Bill and the Fair Housing Act seven days after Dr. King's assassination. So we forced the hand of the nation to do the right thing as far as civil rights and kind of making things um, aesthetically equitable. I think this is really important context, like you're adding. And um, I think, you know, a lot of people tend to think when we talk about these issues, this is kind of history, you know, it's finished. It's not going on anymore. Uh, Particularly certain groups of people, they tend to kind of posturize and say, well, because Trump has gone... Um, it's not that bad. But I would agree with your analysis and argue, yes, absolutely, it's a war. And you see it on many fronts. Um, There's some stuff you mentioned that I'm going to ask you about in a second. But one thing I wanted to ask you about, I think there's like a lot of historical revisionism going on in the United States regarding black history. So not only are these rich stories not pushed to the surface, I think it was in Florida, the Board of Education uh, brought in a rule And they try to now teach that black people benefited from slavery because they learned certain skills. So, yeah, what's your view about the whole kind of historical revisionism, the the attempts to really subvert black history? As I would argue, black history is just coming to the surface, uh, whether people want it to or not. Right. Yeah. When you have a group of people, which are the white supremacists, who do something extremely evil historically and generationally, In the sick minds of these people, they have to come up with ways to rationalize what they're doing. Um, When you sit here and you sell, rape, enslave, brutalize people based on race to to kind of massage that in your mind, you have to say, well, we're we're kind of helping them. If it weren't for us, they would be in a mud hut somewhere. You have to say little weird stuff like that to yourself to justify it, which deep down, you know, it's a lie, because if you thought we were so uh, inept 
you wouldn't have to have all of the oppressive laws that would stop us from progressing. The minute foundation of Black Americans get a little progress, the dominant society goes on alert. That's why they're so um, trippy about this reparations thing, because they understand the things that we've done with just a little bit in the face of oppression, we've been deprived and we are still some of the most influential people on the planet. We can still rise up and, and have our culture shine through. This is with de um, um, deprivation and um, oppression. Just imagine if we get a little leg up financially, we can take things to a whole different level. And that's the thing that's panicking the white supremacists. Everything about our status here is supposed to be subjugation. They wake up and check, okay, are we okay? Let's see what's going on with the black people. Are they still oppressed? Are they, are they still in the ghetto? Uh, if that, that's fine. If they're still oppressed, if they're still in the ghetto, that's fine. We have so many things in this country like free health care. The reason why we don't have that in the medical industry, they're fleecing everybody. We don't have free health care because the, the white supremacists didn't like the thought of black people getting free health care with them. So they're like, they will um, cut off their noses to spite their faces. Dr. Welsing talked about in the 1960s, the rural white people who lived in certain country areas, they would rather live on dirt roads than to have the, the government come in and pave the roads for them and black folks. When they said, oh, black folks are going to get the same paved roads, let's just keep the dirt roads to spite them. So these people are um, almost obsessive with the desire to keep us in an oppressive state. Damn, I mean, I had no idea about the healthcare uh, situation. I mean, that's almost like a pathological hatred of black people to the point you're willing to keep your own condition as it is because you don't okay. want the people. That's incredible stuff. Um, gosh, man. <laughs> when I hear these kind of facts, man, it knocks my head off, to be honest. We have similar uh, dynamics over here, but of course the dynamics are different over there. Um, actually, yeah, one thing I wanted to ask you about too was I think there's often a lot of people, um, obviously there's a lot of good white allies, but there's a lot of people that posture as allies, and then you see their true colors, right? No pun intended. Now, I don't want to make it too sort of personal and individualize it, but one person who's really uh, pissed me off of late particularly is Michael Rappaport, right? He's always had, he's always talking smack about black people, the Palestinians too. And correct me if I'm wrong, but this is a guy that made a documentary about Tribe Called Quest, the Tribe Called Quest. Yeah. And then he has yeah. the nerve to like, um, you know, come out with this vitriol. Um, yeah, maybe just speak on sort of your thoughts, your view about these kind of um, white supremacists that masquerade, not only masquerade as allies, but they actually leech off the culture, because that's something we really need to deal with um, as a collective. Yeah, with Michael Rappaport, and then black folks got to be very careful of what I call the yo, yo, yo white dudes. Um, cats like him who walk around with a black scent. On a street level, and I've always told people, you never trust people like that. Though the white people who walk around with black sense, they are either snitches or they are um, working with law enforcement directly. You got to watch out with people like that, and and they will turn on you at the drop of a hat because it's all performative. It's almost a form of blackface. They've always done that in the Americas. Um, certain music genres popped off because white people would put on blackface and mimic black folks. That's how country music popped off. It was white people um, getting banjos and putting on blackface and doing uh, minstrel shows, singing plantation songs, and that became so popular. They said, hey, let me take this makeup off and still sing like this black person, and that morphed into what the country music genre was. So they've made their um, culture imitating and mocking us to a certain degree. And that's exactly what it is. It's not an affinity. It's a mocking thing. And when they get aggrieved or when they feel aggrieved, you see the real them come out. Like with Michael Rappaport, boy, he 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 ain't using the black scent like he used to no more. He's using some hard R's and some some he's really enunciating some of that hatred for 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 what we're not doing for him and his community. So these people will show their true colors at at any moment. So we always have to be cognizant of that. Yeah, there's another person. I'm not going to put words in your mouth, Tariq, but I think you've even got more kind of tepid examples of that. People like Bill Maher, 
uh, who are kind of more sophisticated with their kind of uh, presentation as a kind of uh, a sort of um, kind of uh, a nice guy in an alley. But uh, I don't want to get into Bill Maher. That's a whole other kettle of fish. But you did just remind me of something that's very, very important. And seeing as it's Black History Month in the United States, let's talk about the fact that rock and roll and country music are also uh, Black American creations. Let's talk about that. Yes, it is. Um, all of these music um, um, genres are the foundation of Black American creations. Um, country music, um, it was Black people coming out of slavery. It was Black people who were working on the railroads. Some of the people who are considered the fathers of um, rock and uh, of um, um, country music, the um, Hank Williams, people like that. Hank Williams was taught and his mentor was the foundational black American brother named Rufus Payne in Alabama. They're very proud to admit this. Um, Johnny or Jimmy Rogers, who's the so-called father of country music, he admitted that he learned country music from black people working on the railroads. These were work songs that foundational black Americans were doing. So back in those days, they would be proud to admit they learned it from a black person because that made the white person seem more authentic, just like hip hop now. When you want a white artist to come out, they have to be attached to a black artist. An Eminem has to get a, a, a Dr. Dre. Um, you, um, what's that? Um, Izzy Azalea, Iggy Azalea, what her name was. She got with T.I. and T.I. kind of brought her out. So you needed a black person to kind of authenticate you. Same thing with country music. They needed a black person to authenticate them. Even with rock and roll. We all know rock and roll that came from foundational black Americans. And the, the term rock and roll was basically um a, a, a meaning for sex that was a slang for sex um one of the fathers of rock and roll ike turner he had the first rock and roll record um you had our brother um bo diddley who basically did something called hambone which is a part of foundation of black american tradition where we play um, percussive um sounds on our bodies and, and rhyme over it he did that on the electric guitar, and that became a, a mainstay in rock and roll um, 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 sounds. So we, and some of these groups, uh, the Rolling Stones, um, they named themselves after a song by Muddy Waters. When the Beatles came over, they were around black people over here. In fact, mm -hmm. the song, fifth Beatle was a black man named Billy, um, Billy Preston. Um, there were black drummers on some of those Beatle records back in the day. The re when the Beatles came over, they were with a black ra record label before they got with the major label. So a lot of this stuff is not known. So people have always came around us and got the game from all of these genres. So I feel like uh, wouldn't be. Uh, I got to touch a little bit more on hip hop because um, I grew up on hip hop. I love the uh, love the art form, love the culture, love the fact it's influenced the world. But I'd also say that like kind of. Um, the origins and where hip hop's at is very political in the sense that hip hop was literally built from one of the most deprived areas um, in New York. Hip hop is again, a black American creation. Other people have come and contributed to it, but it's a black American creation. And also I'd argue that the, the sort of hip hop, like hip hop doesn't always have to have a message, but I'd argue that the artists that have a kind of a uh, productive, uh, positive message, they often kind of get pushed to the side and you get the kind of more, sort of ratchet the more the more kind of corporate stuff pushed to the top right so yeah maybe just explain to our audience that the origins of hip-hop because i know you've been working on that recently too oh yeah yeah we have a document um documentary coming out called microphone check and I, I, we were doing some editing on it last night it's a beautiful beautiful piece and we talk about the origin of hip-hop and we talk about a lot of things that's just never talked about we talk about a lot of the other pioneers who were contributors to it we talk about how a lot of the black folks who were in the Bronx um, moved up there from the South. And we talk about their families. We talk about what made them go to the Bronx. We talk about the funk records they were listening to. We talk about some of the other DJs from other boroughs who were somewhat influential. And we talk about the conditions in the Bronx that created um, hip hop culture. And it's a phenomenal piece. Um, it's We have to understand that when we as black people, when we create something constructive, there's always this desire for people to kind of rip it away from us. Now, when hip hop was viewed as negative, it is a black thing, it's a black thing, it's a black thing. Now that hip hop is going to the Olympics this year, um, it's getting very corporatized. So now they want to start having co-creators latched onto hip hop. Well, it was black 
and brown and Latino and, and Eskimos. They were rapping. So now it's this whole thing where they're trying to do what they did with rock and roll. They're trying to do the same thing they did with country. Well, you have to understand these music genres, rock and roll, jazz, which were black genres, they were portrayed as negative at first. Jazz music, they were calling that degenerate music. Now, when you look at jazz, jazz is a very sophisticated high art form now. But when it was just associated with black people, it was a negative thing, just like with hip hop. So now that there's more positive um, um, shine being put on hip hop, they have to take it out of our hands because they don't want that shine to go to us because we use that influence um, to empower ourselves. But look, look at the artist. They, a lot of times in the music industry, they would like to get artists who are foreigners. Because an artist who's a foreigner, I mean, foreigner to the United States, an artist who's a foreigner, they're not going to make a lot of noise about anything. They're going to be glad to be able to rap and get their check. But you have foundational Black American artists. We, we have a history of getting a platform and using that platform to say, okay, here, I have a platinum record and I'm going to make sure that you know that there's some Black people starving down in Georgia. Um, I just got a Grammy, and I want y'all to, to know that I'm against police brutality. So we use our platforms to um, boost up other people in the community, and they know that that's what our get down is, and they want to kind of quell that. They don't want to get us into a, a position of prominence and influence, and then we start turning on the dominant society. Yeah, man, and it's, um, it's a tragedy because it's such a beautiful thing, really, like hip-hop. He had this kind of art form that's gone on and influenced the entire world, built from the ground up, literally from the rubble, uh, able to be marketable. People love it. It's good sounding music, but it has a message. Um, and for that reason, that's why this kind of debate goes on forever. But this is why I'd argue Tupac Shakur is the greatest of all time. People might argue the rhyme schemes, this, that, and the other, but the message and what he stood for and the body of work he put out before he was sort of like 25, he was a kid, really, when he was taken from us. And actually, just as I'm talking to you, Tariq, I'm also reminded of, um, you know, a great foundational Black American um, man, Muhammad Ali, rest in peace. Now, mm -hmm. for the same reason I'm talking about Tupac, I'll argue Muhammad Ali is the greatest heavyweight of all time. So, um, yeah, it's not really a question in that. I'm just, I'm just acknowledging that the greatness of these figures, how they've really emerged from impossible odds, um, and, and raise the platform for their communities, you know, against the most impossible odds. So, um, yeah, you want to say anything about Muhammad Ali? Well, yeah, Muhammad Ali is the greatest, man. He, a, a foundational black American who was very well respected. And also he was very influential to hip hop because he was an idol. And Muhammad Ali made those rhymes possible and, 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 and um, popular in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. He's going around rhyming in very witty ways. And a lot of rappers of people who became rappers, that's what they were listening to. They were listening to Muhammad Ali. So he was very influential in him just standing up like a man, him not backing down from the U.S. government, using his platform to speak out against the oppressive ills of the U.S. government and taking that thing internationally. Y'all have to understand, Muhammad Ali was going around the world um, negotiating to free hostages. Folks forget that stuff. Muhammad Ali was a very influential brother, and he was loved literally all over the world. So, you know, they hate that type of influence in a brother, because remember, they, they tried to put our brother Muhammad Ali in jail in the 1960s, stripped him of his heavyweight title in the whole nine. And then you mentioned Tupac. Um, Tupac, you know, this brother comes from that the the Black Liberation Army movement, which was an offshoot of the Black Panthers. They always mention the Black Panthers in relation to Tupac, but no, his people were connected to the Black Liberation Army, which were similar to the Black Panthers, but they were very, very way more radical. And Tupac had that radical um, foundational Black American resistance spirit. This is why this brother was so passionate about a lot of stuff. His mother was in a very famous trial in New York where some FBI agents came in and tried to get them to say on tape they wanted to blow up buildings and all of this stuff. And his mother successfully argued her own case and won the case. And I think when she was in jail, she was pregnant with Tupac mm -hmm. at the time. And um, his stepfather, Matula Shakur, that was one of the guys who got um, Afini Shakur, um, not Afini, um, Asada Shakur out of prison, busted her out and got her to Cuba. So this is what Tupac is coming from. So we got to understand this brother, he was most likely monitored by the authorities 
all of his life. I know when he died, there was an FBI dossier on Tupac. So that radical energy was powerful. And they don't, the, the, the dominant society, they don't like that. They don't like us having that kind of influence. Yeah, so I mean, rest in peace to Tupac, Afini, and also Matulu. In fact, in a minute, I'm going to ask you about Nipsey. This is good, man. I wasn't planning to ask you about none of this stuff, but I love how these conversations just flow. Hopefully people okay. can learn. Um, all right, if we mention Tupac, his mother, and Matulu, I feel we've got to mention Sister Asata Shakur. Now, she is one of my heroes. Now, I guess I've got to use the language carefully, right? There's, there's crimes that were alleged against her, um, you know, and many people really believe she's innocent. Man, she's just just a powerful uh, figure. This 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 titan in the movement. Let's um, yeah. If you could just speak about Asata Shakur, her story, her significance, what she means to you personally, really, because she's sort of uh, she's one of the people that really inspires a lot of the people all over the world. She's she's what we would say is like part of the kind of global um, black family of royalty. We're talking about these important people. Asata Shakur and what she stood for is, is right in there. Right. So she was accused of, and Asada Shakur was down with um, different black power movements in, in the United States, and they accused her of shooting a police trooper, I think, in New Jersey. Um, and, and there's a lot of doubt about that. Also, at that time, the early 70s, remember, you still have the COINTELPRO program where they were getting police officers to target people who were considered black radicals. They had just assassinated our brother up in Chicago. Um, what's my guy's name in Chicago? Um, they just they did a movie about him. Um, I cannot think, I always forget my brother's name, um, but he in, in 1969, they shot our brother. And I, I hate that I forget. I, I, I'm Fred Hampton, who is it? Fred Hampton. There you go. I don't know. I always forget Fred Hampton's name. I don't know why I do. But yeah, they assassinated that brother in his sleep. The They, they got the police to do that. So they were doing that to black um, um, activists all over the country at that time. And they were trying to do that to Afeni. And um, it didn't work, but they ended up putting her in prison. And then you had some of the people in the movement break her out and take her to Cuba. But before they took her to Cuba, this was the the, the thing that really rubbed the U.S. government the wrong way. You had people all up in New York and in part of the eastern seaboard who harbored her and didn't snitch on her. In fact, you had black people putting signs on their windows, Asada is safe here. They were letting her know, you can come here and this is a safe house for you. So the community looked out for Asada Shakur because they understood what the her freedom meant. It was a... Um, it was an affront to stand up against the oppressive system. People knew about the COINTELPRO program or what the government was doing. So to see a black person fighting against that, the community stood with her on that. A lot of people feel, you know, really, again, this isn't history. It is history, but these things are still happening now. Um, I want to touch a little bit on, on, on Malcolm. I mean, most people are aware of, you know, arguably one of the greatest revolutionary figures ever, particularly out of America uh, and black America. But regard, we're just talking about the kind of the, the state apparatus. You know, the guys that were wrongly acquitted, uh, wrongly convicted of his assassination, basically been pardoned. I think they're going to get some sort of uh, some sort of check. And if you I think you probably saw the documentary Who Killed Malcolm X. It's interesting that the guy they believe pulled the fatal shot or, or shot the fatal uh, bullet, I should say. He was just walking around in, in full knowledge. Of, oh, of yeah. the authorities. There's an awkward moment where Corey Brooker is interviewed and he has to pretend he doesn't know about this. So, um, yeah, maybe um, talk a little bit about Malcolm and, and the sort of system against him um, and, and how that system is really still operating today because I don't really see this system as ever really... It's been consistent throughout the kind of uh, genesis of America to now. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, our brother Malcolm, you know, he was surrounded by um, feds and agents when he got shot. The... If you go look at old photographs of the day he got shot at the Audubon, there was a guy giving him mouth to mouth. Um, that was a guy named Eugene Roberts, who was a federal agent. I mean, they were all around the guy doing all of this performative stuff. So, yeah, the guy who allegedly was the trigger man, from what I understand, this guy was walking around New Jersey just untouched for years. And that's another thing, man. We, If we have black folks who stand up for us and put themselves on the line, 
we got to do a better job at protecting these people. We got to be a, uh, do a better job of providing justice for them. We can't let our um, riders go out here and get assassinated, and the people are just walking around eating hot dogs and drinking soda for years, and everything is cool. See, the thing, even with the Tupac thing, the the guy who killed Tupac or who was involved in the murder of Tupac, he's running around here doing interviews. You dig, and people are acting like that's cool. That you know, that's 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 not cool stuff to do. So we have to, if we ride with somebody, we got to make sure we ride for them. But just on that note, before I start getting into the politics and reparations, let's um take a minute to just honor uh, Nipsey Hussle because again, um, what a phenomenal human being, uh, such an impactful career, making films, Doctor Sebi, really trying to build in his community. So I guess in sort of the context, what we're just talking about. Um, what would you say about the significance of, of Brother Nipsey and really what happened to him? Because a lot of people, a lot of people, let's just say, are very skeptical about the official narrative of events. That some random, random person just took Nipsey out because he was doing a lot and he had a plan like Tupac, uh, I would argue. Yes, indeed. And Nipsey, very smart guy, very smart brother, doing a lot of stuff for the community out here in Los Angeles. Um, his store over there, the Marathon store, they were under surveillance for a long time. They um, they had gang injunctions on them, um, and they deliberately put those gang injunctions on them, I think, so that they know that they couldn't be armed because they would raid that place. They would go and shake everybody down every blue moon. The police would come and sometimes they would shake down customers so that they had eyes on that place all the time, except the day he got shot. Now, when he got shot, they don't know nothing. Um, and in that area, that plaza, the city was trying to get Nipsey and his brother out of there. They kept trying to do little things to thwart them from having their business there. But Nipsey and his brother, they raised enough money to buy that whole plaza. And that was a power move. And then I think the target really got big on his back because out in here in Los Angeles, in the Crenshaw area, they're building a train station right in the middle of Crenshaw. And the Olympics is coming out here. They just built the SoFi Stadium. So <clears throat> there's a lot of prime real estate in that area. So anytime we start making these real estate deals in prime areas, all of a sudden, shootings and bombs and all types of weird stuff start happening. So there's a lot of fishy stuff going on surrounding the death of our brother Nipsey. And that was one of the reasons why I wanted to do the museum. We got the Hidden History Museum out here because I was inspired by, by Nipsey uh, to keep the marathon going. Because that put a cloud over everybody's head out here. When our brother was um, taken out like that, um, the energy was real bad. So I, I wanted to do something to kind of um, continue our brother's legacy of, hey, let's just not stop doing what we're doing. Let's keep going and let's keep empowering ourselves. Yeah, no, respect for that. The marathon definitely continues. In fact, before we move on, just tell us about the uh, uh, museum, because I'm looking forward to hopefully one day seeing that museum. Um, more power to you, Tariq. Tell us about that museum. And tell us about the, um, not just about the museum, tell us about how you basically got, you got a crowdfunding pretty quick. There, there was a groundswell of support from the community. So I think that's that's like a story in itself as well. Yeah, so man, look, I wanted to do, for those who don't know, I wanted to, I just came up with an idea one day, driving down Crenshaw Boulevard, thinking about Nipsey. I was, I saw a bunch of murals for Nipsey, and I noticed that there were a lot of tourists out in LA. A lot of people would come out here to see Nipsey stuff, and I said, wait a minute, this is, people don't understand LA politics. You can only do that for so long, because out here in LA, it, it, that's kind of a gang-infested area, and they don't like people running around there with cameras. After a while, people kind of start getting killed going out to these spots with cameras. It got kind of bad out here. So I said, I want to have something where people can come and sightsee and but be in a nice and closed, safe place where they're not running around these neighborhoods with cameras, not understanding the politics. So I said, what if I get a museum? I've been thinking about getting a museum somewhere in the country. And I said, I, let me just get, let me get a museum out here in L.A. And I said, let me raise a million dollars. Let me see if I could crowdfund a million dollars. I get it popping. So I put up a crowdfund. Um, as for a million dollars, we actually raised a million dollars in 30 days. Um, amazing feat. People were shocked that we were able to do something like that so quickly. That that hasn't been done in our community. I don't know 
on a grassroots level, that has not really been done like that. And we got the museum uh, about a year late. I put some more money on it. And we've had um, so many wonderful events at the museum. We talk about a lot of things from the Hidden Colors movies. We have events there all the time. It's a nice, safe place. We employ people in the community. We have rap contests, poetry contests. We have stand-up comedy there all the time. We feature a lot of the Black um, um catering businesses and restaurants there all the time. So it's a real staple of the community here, very community oriented. And um, we wanna keep that going. I wanna expand it and and create museums in other parts of the country as well. Man, that'd be something. Uh, for the next question, actually, you reminded me, um, I believe you've got a special kind of shrine, uh, a place to honor uh, Dr. Francis Cress Walsing, who really, I kind of got onto the last few years from you mentioning her name, and maybe one or two others. Um, can you just please explain to the audience um, who Dr. Frances Cress Walsing was and why she was so important? And actually, because from my perception, you know, like from people all across the sort of spectrum of kind of black intellectualism, black thought, people that might even disagree on certain stuff, they all respect Dr. Frances Cress Walsing. So let's, um, let, let's take a minute to um, explain her important significance and who she was. Yeah, Dr. Frances Cress Wilson, she's a black woman from, she was from Chicago, but she lived in DC and she was a psychiatrist. And this sister was really the first person to really psychoanalyze the reason for systematic white supremacy. Um, in the 1950s, she went and studied in, in Germany because she wanted to study the mindset of the Nazis. What made them um, exterminate people like that? What made them commit such an evil atrocity? Um, and she compared what they were doing there to what was happening here in the U.S. And she talked about how the basis of white supremacy is a fear of white genetic annihilation. And she wrote a brilliant book called The ISIS Papers that really scientifically breaks down the mindset of racism. And the sister brought so much clarity to the game. And the, so many people respect her. She was an idol of mine. I put her in um, a few of my movies and um, the movie Baby Boy was based on some of her writings in the beginning of Baby Boy, the, the John Singleton movie. They were using quotes from Dr. Welsing in the beginning of that movie. So I'm talking about how the system of white supremacy will infantilize black men and women. And she was ahead of her time. She told us back in the 70s and 80s that the system of white supremacy creates an effeminized black man. And eventually black men are gonna be running around in dresses, which is what we see right now today. I don't know you uh, you dealt with that with your film, uh, Buck Breaking, which I've seen as well, which that, that to me was quite incredible in a sense. That's a controversial piece, not for people that understand black history and our histories, but like to get that out there. And then I believe you had it trending in, in a couple of categories for a while. That must've been, um, that's pretty powerful. The fact you even got the film out, to be honest, Tariq, and then you yeah. managed to get it trending on number one. I think the haters and the cancel crew came out of you um, for that film, didn't they? Oh, yeah, yeah. They, they made it blow up even more because they were hate watching it. <clears throat> because, see, we talked about in that movie, see, they thought we were just going to focus on the buck breaking that went down on the plantations. No, no, no. Mm. We talked about um, the history of the white supremacists and their buck breaking mindset. When they started coming out of Europe, they started buck breaking the minute they encountered Aboriginal people. They had to dominate people physically and then sexually, especially the males. So that whole thing of dominating a male sexually, that came out of that Greco-Roman culture. That's what Alexander the Great was doing, or the so-called Great. So yeah, we, we go into that whole history. We talk about how um, they're, they're going into Africa with the Catholic Church and some of the stuff they were exploiting the boys, which is what they still do today. Um, they haven't really changed. So we break all this stuff down. A lot of the slave owners were buck breaking. A lot of um, you had transgender um, um, slave owners over here. You had all types of weird stuff going over here. Some of the first sex changes were happening on plantations. There was a woman down in Louisiana, uh, Madame LaLaurie, who was performing crude sex changes on her um, enslaved black people. So there's a lot of long, sick history involving sexual exploitation of black people at the hands of the dominant society. 
Yeah, that's a tough film to, to watch. But to all the viewers, man, you guys need to go and check out that film. That's necessary viewing if you're really serious about understanding where we are in terms of what we've been through as a people in the Caribbean, in, in America. Uh, there's another important point you mentioned, Tariq, which um, f- you know really informs um, how we understand white supremacy today. And as you rightly said, the late, great Dr. Francis Cress Wilson was instrumental in talking about this, the fear of genetic annihilation. Um, yeah, I mean, how do you see that really informing the kind of political sphere, the cultural sphere, sports? I mean, you name it. You see this 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 fear really manifesting itself um, all over the place, right? Yeah, and 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 she even speaking of sports, she talked about how a lot of the sports games are based on that psychological subconscious fear of genetic annihilation. Yeah, especially involving balls and um, like a football and basketball, the brown balls and white balls. She talked about how the brown balls were in sports were subconsciously bigger, and balls that in, that were white were subconsciously smaller. Baseballs are smaller, golf balls are smaller. Uh, and she really Really broke it down you got people you got to really read that book because this sister got real deep even when she talked about in spain when they got the moors out of spain these were black people who dominated the iberian peninsula for seven eight hundred years um they changed the phenotype of spanish and italian people when they had the reconquista they ran the black moors out of spain and a subconscious sport they created from that was the running of the bulls And in Spain, the running of the bulls to this day, they get a black bull and the people dress in white and then run the bull all over Spain, Mm. beating it, hitting it. That came from the expelling of the Moors. And she broke that down eloquently. So a lot of this stuff is real subconscious, but we don't really put two and two together. Yeah, there's so much for people to uh, dig into, really. We're just, like, skimming the surface here. Uh, Just one more quick point as well. I think a lot of people, you know, there's the stuff you're talking about, and then there's the kind of obvious stuff. For example, white nationalism has done what it's done all over the world, and we saw what, you know, Germany produced last century, but I think a lot of people don't know that it was the kind of idea of racial purity, um, of course, that drove Nazism, but they really viewed, um, you know, Jewish communities as kind of having black genes, as being descendants of black people. And that fueled, um, you know, a lot of the hatred, right, if I'm not mistaken. Right, right. That, that was the whole narrative. And in, in, in Mein Kampf, um, Hitler even said that, you know, the Jews, this, this Negro race of people, he referred to Jews as Negroes. And that was the whole problem they really had with Jews. And going back to Mein Kampf, he said, the problem is not the religion. The problem is that they're not white. It was about the, the Jewish people sneaking in the black gene to these people who are supposed to be Aryan and pure race. That was the whole thing. And that came from Spain. Spain had a whole thing um, of a blood purity law going back to 1449, where they wanted to get the Moors and the Jews up out of Spain and some of the mixed race people who were descendants of the white Spanish and the black Moors and the, the the people who were black Jewish, they said, okay, you people can't hold political office no more if you have any of that Moorish or black blood in you. So they had these blood purity laws that they were uh, oppressing people with that came out of Spain first. And then that started to spread to the Americas and all over the world. I think it's interesting. Um... Also, you know, people don't realize, like, there's a backlash. Like, we, we, we've we touched on a lot of stuff about how, you know, black people are the original everything all over the world. That's just a scientific fact. But, for mm-hmm. example, um, we've seen a lot of people that have suggested, pointed to the fact that black people are at the kind of really beginning genesis of all religions, including Judaism. Um, it's not mm-hmm. anti-Semitic to say that. Everyone who's against racism is against racism, including racism against Jews. However, if you look at tribes like the Lemba um, and other different tribes, they've literally got that that gene going right back to the original tribe of Judah. And, and yet when people suggest, hey, you know, black people were the original Hebrews or whatever, it's, boy, cancel time, you know, they're losing sponsors. Right, right, right. And it's a, it's a nuts situation to be in, really and truly. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's, I mean, history is history. I mean, they're one of the, the, the people who spread a lot of early knowledge about Judaism and in Europe, the guy kind of became a celebrity in the Middle Ages, a black man named Eldad the Danite. And he went into to Europe 
talking about Judaism and um, Hebrewism. And um, this was a black man who was a celebrity at the time. So, yeah, there were black people who were Jewish. And again, some of the so-called the anti-Semitism comes from the, the fact that there were black people who were Jewish. It's a racist thing more than anything. Yeah. Um... Now, I could chat to you all day. You know, a couple more questions, Tariq, because an hour has flown by already. Uh, on just the last point, uh, guys, go and check out um, the work of Bishop Talbot Swan, too, because I've spoken to him um, about this issue, the fact that Jesus was black was certainly a man of color, whatever you want to call it. Um, and there's evidence literally in the Bible, um, all kinds of evidence, which, which really points to the people in that part of the world at that time um, having black skin. It's just a fact. Uh, people need to dig a bit deeper with that. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit, Tariq, and talk a bit more about America now. Um, there's a key election coming up. Now, uh, one of the reasons I respect you and many other people respect you is because you've been very clear and consistent in in, in raising the, the sort of platform about reparations, explaining the moral right, the legal argument uh, for it. So how's that looking in the US? And are there any political candidates right now who are seriously... Um, taking on board a black agenda that encompasses um, reparations in addition to police brutality, that kind of thing, in your estimation? Well, yeah, well, they're, they're not, they're trying to um, negate what we're saying, but they have to acknowledge it. We're forcing them to acknowledge it, and especially the Democrats. We're really holding them to the fire because we've sat here and supported them for generations after generations, and now they're sitting here playing games with our money. So the Democrats, we are willing to let them crash and burn if they don't get up off the pot and make something happen with what these reparations um, conversations are about. Um, we don't have a problem with getting them out the paint. We're letting folks know we're not going to support none of these folks if they're not bringing something to the table for foundational Black Americans, especially because of our lineage and what has happened to us in our lineage. And the name of the game is to get us on the political treadmill. And they feel like if people um, are negating a system or neglecting a system or um, uh, rejecting a system, that group can potentially become dangerous. So they're watching this whole thing very closely, but we are standing on our square. Now, there are some people coming around, they're talking reparations, but they're, they're trying to trick bag it up. You have these politicians now, they'll say reparations, but then they'll say reparations, that's a school loan. No, 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 no. We're letting people know what the definitions of rep reparations is going to be. They're not going to get to redefine it. So it's up to the grassroots, and we're sticking on our square, making sure the definition of reparations is right and exact. So we're going to get reparations eventually. We're definitely going to get it. But we just have to stay on our square, and they're not used to us being this consistent. Because a lot of times we talk about reparations historically, they start smacking us down and denigrating us, and we get scared and we sliver back somewhere. We're not doing that this time, and they're not used to that. This is a whole different vibe now. There's a whole different movement now. So, um, there's a delineation movement where we're saying, okay, reparations is not going to be a black thing. It's going to be an, uh, an ethnic lineage thing for a lineage group. And that was the thing that messed them up because that was a political legal maneuvering that they didn't expect us to do. Because if they do something that's race-based, they can say, hey, the Constitution says you can't do race-based stuff, so we'll strike it down. But you can't stop somebody from taking care of some kind of legal or, or lineage-based co um, compensation. Because they do lineage-based compensation all the time. They give lineage-based compensation to Jewish people. They give lineage-based compensation to um, Native American tribes. They gave lineage-based compensation to the Japanese. So they can't deny us that now on constitutional basis now. So this is why we're sticking on our square, and we're going to get reparations eventually. For real. I mean, personally, I don't have a problem with other groups that have been oppressed getting reparations. That's the right thing to do. But of course, Absolutely. when it comes to black people, and it's the same here in the UK, um, all of a sudden, it's a kind of endless debate just designed to drag on forever. Um, and, you know, all of a sudden, it's kind of the, everybody gets lifted up when these policies happen, but there's no specific black policies. And I just want to make one more quick point here. You know what I mean, Tariq? I'm, I'm a journalist, Tariq, so I try to play, I try to be fair, regardless of my personal views of politicians. But I've been watching Joe Biden and what he's done for four years. And on day one, there was a bunch of executive orders signed for all sorts of groups. No problem with that. From my perspective, anyway, you, other people might disagree. There's been no specific policies to deal with the systemic racism faced by Black Americans, including reparations. I think there was one executive order 
in May last year, if I'm not mistaken, regarding policing, right? And it's designed to gather information on federal officers and police brutality, where most police brutality cases are happening with state officers. So right. I think what I'm trying to say is there's been nothing of any substance. People might chime in and say, all right, HBCUs, whatever else he's done, Biden has not fulfilled his promise. And again, right. I want to link it back to the UK. People are really having the same conversation over here, Tariq. What are we getting for our votes? We've been voting for decades, if not more, and we're not, not getting anything for our votes. Um, I don't really see people falling for it for too much uh, longer. At least in the US, you guys are having a conversation about reparations. I can tell you, over here, it's not even in the conversation as much as we're trying. Oh, wow. Wow. So we, we got to get that popping over there, too. Uh, because yeah, we want we want to see our brothers and sisters get what they're supposed to get over there, man. The the Windrush um, generation, man, that helped rebuild um, the UK and, and Britain over there, man. Because um, after World War II, it was devastated over there, man. So the brothers and sisters went over there and literally rebuilt that place up, man. So they got to get the same compensation over there as well. Hundred percent. Yeah, my grandfather was actually part of that generation, and I think there's an interesting parallel between the Great Migration in in America. Well, let's be clear: black people were, were, were fleeing terrorism, um, white supremacist terrorism, which is also in the north, and chasing the money that had been taken away from them. And there's a correlation between the migration of people from the Caribbean over to Britain. But that's a whole other conversation. Um, yeah. Just quickly, Tariq, because uh, the time's rattling on. I'm conscious of your time, but I've got to talk to you about police brutality, and I, I really want to break this down for the audiences. There was a perception, again, I said it earlier, that when Joe Biden came in, white supremacy had taken a hit, blah, blah, blah. It's all nonsense. Now, actually, Jason Mead, Jason Mead, who killed Casey Goodson, unarmed Casey Goodson, he's now uh, facing the heat. But we got cases like Jordan Neely, all sorts of examples of police brutality. The stats speak for themselves. Um, let's talk about the need for an anti-black hate crime bill and how that would be enforced, because... Black people should already be protected under the Constitution, right? So, yeah, maybe break down um, police brutality, the need for an anti-black hate crime bill, and how reparations feeds into that. Because if the police are not only not protecting, but are killing, we should be able to protect ourselves uh, and have the funding for that, that we are owed. Right. And, and it's very important that we get a very specific bill for us, because a lot of people will try to use the whole thing. Well, because we point out that there's an anti-Asian hate crime bill. You, you can't do a hate crime against an Asian person. They made a specific bill for Asian people and they try to pretend that they didn't do it, but it's very well documented. And when we talk about getting a similar bill, they say, well, you already got protections. No, because it's not being enforced the way it's supposed to be enforced. It's very vague. It's like it's using minorities and marginalized people, and people of color. No, no, no. We need just what the agents are getting, because when you put it in name and say something specifically, that group has now the legal uh, wherewithal to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. See, if they put out, if we have a, a, a crime bill that says, hey, we, the US government, we denounce any anti-black hatred, because that's what they did with Asian people. That means now we are justified in defending ourselves. We don't even have to wait on law enforcement because the bill is there, the law is there, and we can enforce the law. And if something happens to us, we can say, hey, look, this person was practicing anti-black racism. Where like with Asian people, if you get in an argument with them, they pull that law on you. That's an anti-Asian hate crime immediately. And we need that same protection. And there's no reason why they don't do that other than they're just being spiteful towards us. So that would be a part of the reparations package as well. That and direct check payments, because we're not doing the whole um, HBCU funding. We're going to get a community basketball center. We're going to get a, a hairstyle bill. We don't know that none of that is reparations. Reparations is one thing and one thing only. Cash payments direct to the foundation of Black American descendants of freedmen and slaves. Absolutely. And presumably an anti-black hate crime bill would be a deterrent against racist attackers, potential attackers, yeah. because correct me if I'm wrong, Tariq, but wouldn't that open up another potential like set of litigation and lawsuits against people who, who did it? So, you know, they could be prosecuted under existing hate crime legislation. But if it was provably anti-black, then they can be hit in their pockets or get a jail term, um, you know, a longer sentence. Right. Is that how it works? It it, it would work like that. And also that would stop a lot of these white supremacists who's working in law enforcement. Mm. The uh, FBI, they specified years ago that law enforcement around the country has been completely infiltrated by white supremacist groups. White nationalist organizations made a concerted effort to join law enforcement 
for the sole purpose of terrorizing the black population. And that's exactly what they did. But the government didn't do anything about it. They just said it and then didn't say anything else. And now we see the backlash and the ramifications of it. We see these black folks getting killed left and right. And these um, police officers out here with these weird tattoos and throwing up these weird white supremacist hand signs and hanging with these other white supremacist groups like the Proud Boys and um, uh, Patriot Front and all of these people. So that's why we need that hate crime bill, specifically uh, mentioning us by name. It's kind of crazy that uh, Christopher Ray, the FBI director, even acknowledged January 6th was uh, an act of domestic terror, and yet the Proud Boys that participated in it, about two or 300 of them, they're still oh, yeah. not described as a terror group, even though Canada did it. Um, do you think a situation like that could emerge again? Because... You know, white liberals uh, who often posture as allies, you know, I think that's, that was a wake up call for them. But of course, black people have been experiencing white supremacist terror forever. Um, do you think anything has changed since 2020 up to now? Do you, or do you think that situation could arise again? It could possibly arise again. It, you know, a, a, a situation where they storm the Capitol. But right now, I think um, they're, they are going to have security so tight now. And that's probably why they're trying so bad to, to not let Trump win. They're putting all these charges on him and these big judgments on him because they don't want him to kind of do a, a similar thing like that. So it's interesting to see how all of this stuff is going to play out. Mm, how do you think it's going to play out come November? Because if, again, it's a bit like the UK, like, how do you like your white supremacy, the fox or the wolf? Right. Uh, Biden right. or Trump? Because let's, you know, I want to make something clear. We talked a lot about Biden. Guys, he's the sitting president. If Trump ever gets in again, we'll critique him. But Biden's the president. How, how do you see stuff playing out, Tariq, in the coming months? It's looking bad for Biden because Biden don't really have a base no more. Mm -hmm. and, and he's letting over a lot of people, um, flooding the borders and using our tax dollars to fund these people in the middle of a reparations movement. They're, while they're telling us, we can't give you black people money. But here's an open check for all of these other groups that's coming in. That's not playing good for him at all. And black people are speaking out openly in all of these Democratic run cities where this nonsense is happening. So it's looking very bad for Biden. So I, I want to see how the Democrats are going to even try to um, get a life force with this thing going on. Because Trump, you know, all these charges they're putting on Trump, you know, he still has a solid base. The Democrats don't have that solid base no more. Democrats look desperate. I saw that real cringe hip hop initiative they put out the other day. I mean, it feels like they're toe deaf and they got very bad advice at the moment, uh, to be honest okay. with you. And as you rightly said, Tariq, I just want to highlight one more thing. I think the New York governor in recent days or right before Black History Month signed off $180 million to the Jewish community in Germany and the descendants of those who suffered the Holocaust. So people can't say there's no money for reparations. And people can argue that how it looks. There's not been a single dollar from the federal government. Um, last question, Tariq, I'll land on this. Do you think there could be a situation where if states bring about reparations packages, it could kind of wag the tail of the federal government and push them into action? I've been wondering about that. That's a possibility. That's why we're stumping so hard out here in California. That's why we were very, very adamant about getting the language right and making sure the documentation was right out here so that it can at least be a template for other documents around the country and possibly the federal government. So we're all of this stuff, we're staying on top of it. And everybody's so codified. All of these different reparations hearings and task force um, agencies that's around the country, people are on top of them, making sure the language is right. And the minute we see the language isn't right, they're being delegitimized. Absolutely. All right, Tariq, um, tell us what you're up to now. Tell us where the people can find you. Man, you guys can find me on Twitter at Tariq Nasheed. Check out the movie Microphone Check coming soon in a couple of months. You can go to hiddenhistorymuseum.com to get this book, Hidden Heroes from A to Z. You can go to rootworkstyle.com to get our rootwork deodorant. And you can go to fbastream.com to watch all of the documentaries there. All right. Thank you guys for tuning in. We've been speaking to Mr. Tariq Nasheed. I'm Richard Sudan. Thank you guys for tuning in. Remember to share this video and we will see you guys next time. Thank you so much, brother.